Hello, many of you have requested from the Sierra Club that we give you some guidance regarding backpacking and how to pack for backpacking. Backpacking is a great form of recreation. It's basically the principle of backpacking is to balance weight and what's essential, what you actually need to survive while you're out on the trail for a few days, several days. And so we're talking today about <clears throat> overnight camping in a primitive condition. Minimizing the weight is important. On the other hand, you don't want to leave out anything that may be uh, critical to your survival and your safety while you're out on the trail. So uh, guidance has been given to us over the years from a number of hiking and backpacking organizations. Uh, <laughs> this guidance is known as the 10 Essentials. And so we're going to talk about your contents of your backpack in terms of these 10 essentials right now. Um, the first is navigation. First off is a compass, pretty basic. Some maps. Always helpful to have a backup. Most of us these days are using our smartphone as our navigation tool as well. There's a number of really good navigation tools, GPS type mapping tools, the software that you can get for your phone, which um, you know have the maps, have waypoints on them, tell you mileage, uh, tell you elevation. Very, very useful. Probably the, the most used app right now is Gut Hooks, um, and you can download different maps from all over the country uh, for Gut Hooks. Um, all Trails is another one that's used quite a bit. Um, another navigation tool that I highly recommend is a, uh, at least to have a GPS spotter so folks can find you if you're lost. I have, in addition to the spotter, uh, a little enhanced unit called a Garmin InReach. And this is really great because it allows me to <clears throat> um, send a beacon every half hour up through the satellite system and it notifies folks that I want to uh, apprise of my whereabouts, <clears throat> of where exactly I am along my route. I can put a route and pre-plan the route ahead of time. I can put it up on a map on a website that's secured. And then um, this little unit will broadcast my position every 30 minutes, or actually the interval is user definable. And uh, so people back home know where I am and that I'm getting to where I plan to be during the, uh, the hike. And in addition, I can do text messages with this unit. So uh, in many areas where we hike, cell phone coverage is very limited and it's difficult to get messages out or phone calls out. So using this device, I can message people that I need to reach using the satellite system rather than the cellular system for my communication. It also has an emergency button. So if I push this emergency button, it will automatically contact the nearest uh, you know, rescue emergency medical services who can come and help me in case of an emergency. So I highly recommend something like this. There's a fee for the unit itself, of course, and then there's a service fee for maintaining your presence on the satellite system. And then here's the little charging unit. So those are some of the basics for the navigation essential item. The next essential item is headlight. Now, different uh, organizations have slight variations on the 10 essential items. Some people put the headlight in with the safety items, which we'll get to soon. Some people put a headlight in a, its own category. This is for illumination, obviously. It's for finding your way in the dark. And as well, you carry extra batteries. And the next essential item is sun protection. So sunglasses, very important here in Florida. We're pretty aware of the importance of sun protection. And a good hat, a wide brim hat is very good to protect yourself from the sun. Some people just like to wear the ball cap, but then you gotta be sure to consider your ears. And to that end, we want to use some sunscreen on exposed parts of our body. 
so we don't get a bad sunburn or develop bigger problems later on down the road. Uh, clothing is important, so it's good to cover all parts of your body when you can with a long sleeve shirt, long pants. Of course, for comfort, um, you know, you may want to have short sleeves at some point. You might, may want to wear shorts. Um, in that case, be sure to use your sunscreen. Another item that I've used, particularly in Florida, where the sun and the heat can get quite brutal in open areas when you're not under a uh, tree canopy, is a, a very lightweight hiking umbrella. This can be used for rain protection, but also for sun protection. The old uh, concept of a parasol. So just folds out like that, and then it rolls back up. You can put it right into your pack, and it's very lightweight, this one. Okay, the third essential item is first aid. Also, we might want to talk about insect protection. That could be categorized with the first aid. Uh, it could be its own category. But let's talk about that now. Insects are bothersome, but they also can be dangerous, particularly a uh, big risk out on the trail right now are ticks, several different kinds of ticks that lead to di several different types of illnesses which can be lifetime illnesses and chronic conditions you'll face the rest of your life. So one thing you might want to do is treat your clothing um, with uh, permethrin. You can buy that in a spray bottle. You coat your, all your, <coughs> your clothing, particularly down towards your, uh, towards your feet, with permethrin and let it dry and soak in completely and then uh, that, that'll protect your clothing for several wearings and what that does is it repels uh, ticks and other insects from crawling um, into you know up your leg on your on your clothes and getting into your the rest of your body so uh, I really recommend doing that prior to going on a hiking keep away bugs away from your face you can get this little head net this is very lightweight very breathable Again, have your own portable uh, bug screen. Insect repellent, of course. There's a, a number of different kinds. This one is one I've been using it's a, lately. It's very good. It's good particularly for ticks called Picaridin, P-I-C-A-R-I-D-I-N. And uh, it's a lotion you put on, so the, the, it doesn't smell as bad as some of the, as some of the other bug sprays. and it, uh, goes on easily and it stays on really well and it really is effective in keeping away mosquitoes and particularly ticks. So, okay, so next we have the first aid item. Okay, so here are some of the items that I have in my first aid kit. Of course, you want various types of bandages. You'll invariably get some types of cuts or abrasions or blisters out on the trail and you want to treat those as soon as you can um, because you're out there with a lot of dirt and other things that can affect your cut. So of course you want to first apply some antibiotic ointment like Neosporin and then put on your your bandage. For bigger cuts you have bigger bandages you'd have some tape for the gauze pads or bandages that you'd bring uh, uh, we have some kind of antiseptic wipe you could use. Um, <clears throat> it's good to have just uh, some razor blades, sewing needles, thread, some swabs, uh, and pins, safety pins to use. So you can make a little pack like that. You want to bring a whole you know, bottle of everything. You want to just <clears throat> select what you might need for the trip and pack that in a separate little container. Um, here are a bunch of different pills. I have ibuprofen, <clears throat> pain relief. Um, I have some anti-diarrheal. I have some different kinds of, you know, for indigestion and any other kinds of medication like that <clears throat> um, that you would need on the trail. Allergy medicine, 
Um, this here is called Compede, uh, and this is uh, for treating blisters. This is a you're like a miracle cure for blisters. It's like uh, <clears throat> it's like those little patches you used to get, like this. They call moleskin. I still have some moleskin, but this is treated with some medication, so it's really effective um, in clearing up blisters much more quickly than just putting on a moleskin or, or tape. So um, really recommend these. Uh, they also are made by Band-Aid brand now, but I usually just order these online <coughs> uh, and I get them under the Compede name and uh, they have different sizes in here. So I usually bring a pack of those. Uh, a, a bad blister can really end your hike or seriously uh, inconvenience you on the trail. Um, here's some clotting product to help stop bleeding. Um, I also, to prevent blisters, use this called foot glide. And I found this is effective. <clears throat> Spread this on my feet, on the soles of my feet, where I typically get hot spots and blisters. And that helps prevent abrasion on those areas. And I uh, will get to this in the clo clothing section, but I also usually wear uh, sock liners as well as socks. Um, there's some of your first aid items. You pack as many as you need. I put together a little pack like this. And again, it's custom for me. I don't usually just go with a store-bought first aid kit because it's usually much heavier than really what I need to take with me on a backpacking trip. The next essential item is water. Uh, Again, this is another one of these balancing factors. If you're going out for several days, you're not gonna be able to carry enough water for you to survive on. Uh, it's gonna be just too heavy. Uh, a liter of water equals a kilogram of weight, which is about 2.2 pounds. So this here is a smart water bottle, which I carry and use and reuse because it's very, very light. Um, and so I usually take a couple of these. This is one and a half liters. So to give you an idea, so this is going to be a, a little over two pounds. <clears throat> you probably would use at least two of these, probably more, a day to satisfy your hydration needs. And uh, so if you're going for three days, now you're talking about 12 pounds additional weight to carry, which is going to be basically unsustainable for for most people or what I would recommend for comfort and enjoyment of your hike. Um, so we typically do not carry all the water we need. We typically find water sources along the way. <clears throat> so this is uh, why planning is important. You plan your route so you're near known water sources. So you can do that <clears throat> by consulting guides and other people on Facebook groups or what have you to plan your trip so that you are um, getting access to some water sources along the way. Now, any water source out in the wild should be suspect. They could look like the clearest mountain stream, but you don't know what's really going on upstream <clears throat> in terms of you know, animals, uh, use of them, or even humans polluting those streams. So we always want to at least filter our water. So um, I would recommend carrying a small filter like this. <clears throat> this is a Katahdin uh, squeeze filter. And so this is a bag that we fill with water. You wanna keep your, wa your dirty water container completely separate from your clean water container. That way you won't cross uh, contaminate your water source. So you fill this up with water and then you just squeeze it out through this filter and that takes out um, all are most of the bacteria and a lot of the common viruses. Um, if you really are concerned about the quality of the water source, you may want to treat the water as well. Boiling is definitely recommended. So you can boil your water and that will help remove contaminants um, that could make you sick. Um, we also have these drops called Aquamira and these are good as well. You mix these together and shake them up in the water bottle and th this will also uh, disinfect your water. Um, I recommend carrying a little scoop of some sort. This is just 
the bottom of a smart water bottle that I've cut out with a, with a knife. So, because many times your water sources are uh, not very deep. You know, you just got a trickle of water, you know, or a little puddle almost. <laughs> in many cases, particularly in Florida where everything's so flat, you're gonna just be able to scoop up this water into your bag and then you filter it. <clears throat> And so you filter it back into your bottle and you carry your bottles. So <clears throat> I would suggest <clears throat> doing that and replenishing the water along the way. If you're, <clears throat> you know, between sources and you need more, you can bring other extra containers. You don't have to always use them. Here's something people like to use is this bladder system where you can be hydrating while you're, while you're hiking. This is commonly used by bicyclists and also hikers and uh, so you can use that as well but uh, I'd recommend spraying your containers and not filling them unless you really need it but hydration is so important you're going to really suffer on the trail you could have some problems with heat exhaustion um, and uh, heat stroke if you don't keep properly hydrated um, <clears throat> There's some other things we'll talk about in terms of hydration once we get to the food section. <clears throat> uh, I've experienced dehydration on the trail and it's uh, not pleasant. Um, always keep your, your body hydrated. You're doing more work than you're used to doing. Uh, you're carrying more weight than you normally do. In many cases, you're uh, changing elevation. You're hiking upwards in elevation um, and putting more uh, stress on your muscles and your heart and your lungs than normal so um, you're going to be consuming and needing more water in the cells in your body so uh, and all the minerals that are in that water so please uh, make sure you hydrate properly okay next is shelter very important I have uh, my one-man tent this is uh, my big Agnes uh, Fairly lightweight. It's not the super lightest weight of any tent, but it's a it's a nice lightweight, comfortable tent. Your tent poles, your tent stakes. Uh, some tents will come with a footprint or an under tarp. Um, I just cut my own because I didn't come with it. So I use uh, Tyvek. It's very tough. Tyvek is a building material used for siding. Very lightweight but very strong, and it's very inexpensive. You can pick up a roll of it at a hardware store for a few bucks. And then you've got a lifetime supply of Tyvek. So that's basically your, your shelter. So some people like to hammock camp. Hammocks with a appropriate tarping uh, is also a good shelter. It's really acceptable as long as you find a place to hang your hammock. You may want to just use a tarp system. Uh, so at the very least, just bring a small tarp and know how to, how to set a tarp to provide shelter for yourself in the wilderness. Okay, the next essential item is clothing. Uh, you should be prepared for any type of weather <clears throat> that you may encounter along the way, and you should have some backup supply of clothing, particularly if you're going into a, a cold environment. <clears throat> actually quite common even in the summer if you're at elevation and you're in a northern climate. Um, so you really want to be able to prevent yourself from getting hypothermia, getting too cold. And uh, so you always need to prepare, be prepared for that, have a change of the essential items in case where you may get your primary uh, clothing wet. <clears throat> so that said, we don't want to pack too much clothing. Uh, it's easy to overpack. Uh, while you're on the trail, you really don't need to have a fresh outfit every day like you would at home, of course. So in terms of uh, warmth, you'd start with a, a base layer if, if needed again. So I've got a, a top that's insulated, lightweight, and also long bottom base layer. And many times I'll use that as sleepwear if I'm not using it during the day. Um, then you have a mid layer. 
Next item in the clothing category is uh, rain protection. This um, is very important, particularly in colder environments. Um, uh, in warmer climates, rain gear is uh, tricky because of the breathability. Uh, you're going to sweat <clears throat> when you put on uh, anything waterproof. So you're going to get wet underneath <clears throat> Uh, your rain jacket from your own perspiration. In a warmer environment, uh, I always bring the rain gear, um, but I tend to uh, use it tactically just in certain cases where uh, I know I'm going to need it just for a short period of time or I'm not going to work, work up a huge sweat <clears throat> while I'm wearing it. So uh, rain gear is something you should bring. Um, but you should be judicious in the way you use it or it's kind of a waste. Um, so, got this rain jacket in um, heavy. Okay, this is very, very lightweight. This is breathable fabric. Um, you know, it's got a rain hood as well. Uh, this is an excellent product. Um, and then the lower half of your body, you, you should cover that as well. Upper half is more important, but you know, if your lower half of your body is wet, you're still gonna have some risk of hypothermia and discomfort even. So we have these rain pants. So this is possibly a good inexpensive alternative, but very lightweight. And these are called frog togs. You can get them at Walmart. So that's one option. Another option that just helps you get more ventilation would be a rain kilt, a rain skirt. And this is a very lightweight one that folds up into a little pouch. And, uh, and you just undo it. And there's a little Velcro belt. You just strap it on. And then you've got some ventilation underneath the skirt. Um, you can also use it if you need to change in public places where you, you don't have any privacy. So you can throw that on and take everything off underneath it. Then in terms of your pack itself, you have your typical pack cover. So this pack cover will keep your pack dry and obviously the contents dry. Uh, I tend to secure my contents with waterproof bags. I, I use just a big trash bag for a lot of my loose items because it packs better than packing a bunch of dry sacks in there. I do use some dry sacks in addition to that big trash bag uh, to secure clothes and things that compact well and don't take up a lot of space so they can pa be packed into little nooks and crannies inside your pack. Now let's talk about footwear. Let's begin with socks. Uh, like I mentioned before, I use the foot glide as my first layer. So the next item that I put on my feet are these sock liners. And these are just very lightweight synthetic material. And <clears throat> then we use socks. Uh, in all cases, with our clothing, our shirts, pants, uh, we, we do not want to wear cotton. Uh, it's an old expression, cotton kills. Cotton takes a long time to dry out. It absorbs your perspiration. It doesn't duct well at all. Uh, you know, on your hike you should bring clothing made of either wool or synthetic material. This is a soft wool blend sock with some synthetic material, mostly wool. Um, and you can get very soft wool that isn't scratchy but uh, avoid those cotton socks. Same way with your shirt and pants. This is uh, all synthetic material and that's what you should be wearing out on these hikes. Okay, continuing with footwear, what should, you, what should your shoes be like? Shoes or boots, uh, waterproof, non-waterproof. Uh, the consensus is becoming in most cases to wear lightweight 
uh, not waterproof, uh, breathable uh, footwear. Um, the reason for this is uh, unless your boot is up to your knees or your, uh, or your hips, you're probably going to at some point face uh, flooding on a trail that would uh, exceed the tops of your boots and then water is going to get inside of your boots and if you have waterproof boots then it's going to be almost impossible to get them dried out in the time that you're out on your hike. Wear very quick drying, very uh, well ventilated shoes that are built for trail walking, trail running um, and uh, there's a lot of these on the market now. You want them made for for uh, hiking, not for running. They have uh, some good tread on them to get good traction like you would in a hiking boot. But then you've got this very breathable material on the top that'll keep your feet cool. They're extremely lightweight, which will help you uh, with your endurance and be able to cover more miles with less fatigue. And uh, they're very, very comfortable. So it's really important to get comfortable, lightweight, and good fitting footwear for hiking. Um, so I would suggest uh, going and getting yourself fitted at a good outdoor store. If you've never done this before, don't just buy your normal size off, off the internet <laughs> that you wear for a, a walking shoe. Your foot can feel okay for the first few miles. It's over multiple miles that uh, you begin to take a toll uh, on your feet and you begin to feel the uh, pressure points and the hot spots and that lead to, to blisters. Um, the other factor for footwear, of course, is, is how it supports your foot. Some people prefer a little higher top just to support ankles if they have weak ankles. Um, what I find the most important thing is just to get the foot <coughs> fitted properly within the shoe in terms of the width, in terms of how it fits and holds your foot. If your foot is sliding around inside your shoe, you'll have trouble uh, maintaining uh, stability and traction on the trail. And so all those things are really important. Um, go to someone who knows how to fit you uh, when you're buying your first set of hiking shoes or boots and then really take them out for a test run before you get out on a on a extended hike go do you know five to ten miles just uh, walking around your neighborhood or a local trail where you can you know get some help easily and get home easily if you begin to have foot problems to sum up the clothing category I'd suggest you bring a change of shirt uh, additional layers <coughs> for warmth as needed for your weather forecast, rain gear, and at least one change of socks. I usually bring two pairs of extra socks and I pack those. Um, and you might uh, want to bring an extra pair of underwear. And that's pretty much all you need is, is uh, a change of socks and probably change a shirt and underwear and then any additional layers you might need for the weather conditions you're facing. It looks like uh, weather down into the 30s and 40s you'll want in addition to your mid layer you'll want uh, some type of warm outer layer usually uh, like a puffy jacket which can be compressed and packed into a small space um, but provides a lot of warmth and uh, if you're in inclement weather another thing you would use your your ring gear for your ring jacket is also an outer shell so it provides wind protection and helps keep you insulated so that's it on the clothing next up is the repair kit uh, this would be everything you need in order to take care of uh, repairing your gear on the trail typically that includes a knife at the very minimum uh, I just carry a very lightweight pocket knife 
um, and it's sufficient for most things I need to do, like cutting string and rope, um, being able to uh, uh, cut away small brush to clear a space for my campsite, etc. Um, in addition to a knife, uh, another good item to bring is duct tape, sort of the all-purpose repair item you can use to fix almost anything. So I don't bring a whole roll of duct tape just to save space and weight. I just bring a smaller roll that I make and uh, so I have enough that, I'll, that I would need in an emergency situation. Um, I also bring um, replacement shoestring shoelaces. They can also be used as string to, uh, to uh, do other repair jobs. We, I also like to include in this category uh, emergency um, devices such as an emergency whistle. You would use this to help people locate you uh, in a rescue situation uh, to find you if you're lost in the woods and they're coming after you. This is a way to signal to them that you have an emergency, that you need help and to follow the source of the sound to find you. Uh, in addition, I carry a small mirror. This, it, again, will help rescuers locate you if they are attempting to rescue you by air or they're looking from a elevated position and uh, you flash this in the sunlight and uh, it can be seen for miles. Uh, the next essential item is fire. So um, fire can help you in a cold situation to regain heat, um, to avoid hypothermia, help you in terms of being able to cook your food. So it's an important factor in nutrition. So fire is pretty basic. You should always have a fire kit, fire making kit. Um, so obviously we want matches, fireproof matches, a little small lighter, lightweight lighter, butane lighter. And then if those two fail, I also carry this fire starter and uh, this is a flint and so this produces a spark that you can use to begin to combust tinder. I also have these small fire starter items here. These are called wet fire so all you need with these is to scrape a little bit of it, this white material, it's sort of a chalky substance uh, scrape flakes of it uh, underneath your your wood tinder and uh, or your leaves or palm fronds and then that will begin, and begin to catch fire and this will su sustain fire for uh, a, a good time almost up to a minute sometimes it allows you to sustain a flame that will catch your smaller tinder on fire uh, it's a really handy item for starting a fire easily um, also, there's other alternatives. Some folks carry cotton balls soaked in alcohol. That will work. So that's basic fire starting items. We want to talk about your cook kit. We'll talk about the food a little bit later in another essential item. But <clears throat> in order to, uh, to cook, uh, you could cook over your own wood fire um, if you uh, are able to um, find something to support your pots and pans, uh, a little more elaborate. Also, regulations on some of the public trails, um, you know, prevent you from making fires. And also, um, in order to cook every night, it may be cumbersome to build a fire every single night. And so, uh, if you're going to cook your food, it's recommended you bring a small, lightweight, portable stove system. So this uh, stove that works off these gas canisters here, and it's very small as you can see, you just screw it into the, to the fuel canister, and then these supports open up and you can put a pot on top of this. It's a very hot flame, you control the flame by this 
get this switch here and it all packs up nice and compact and lightweight. Um, for pots, I recommend uh, a, a jet boil system or something similar to that. This uh, has a bottom that has uh, very effective heat conduction uh, I, material <clears throat> that allows your pot to heat up very quickly in a small amount of time so you don't waste fuel and time. So this will boil water, a cup, couple cups of water in under two minutes. So this is a handy to have. A little bulky but you can pack things inside of it and save space that way. Okay, the last essential item we're going to talk about uh, is food. Your food should be lightweight, as light as possible. Um, to do that, you're going to pack a lot of items that are dehydrated or freeze-dried, such as the, uh, the camping prepackaged food that's sold in a lot of outdoor stores. This is an example of that. <clears throat> These, these meals you are pretty much complete dinners, uh, provide you a lot of nutrition, a lot of calories, and they uh, um, are rehydrated with boiling water, but they don't take a lot of weight in your pack. Um, you know, things that pack well, you know, I, I bring tortillas instead of bread, for example, if you like bread, like to make sandwiches. Protein is important. Bring these little tuna and chicken packs for lunches. Um, granola in the morning is what I like. Other people bring other items. Um, so you can suit yourself and try to keep them uh, either dehydrated or very lightweight. <clears throat> uh, you know, you don't want to carry the water weight that's uh, in most foods. I mean, fresh fruit, maybe one or two pieces is nice for the trail, but uh, it's a lot of water weight in there dried fruit would pack a lot better. Um, and I also repackage a lot of my food. So instead of bringing along this big container, which is actually, in most cases, two servings, I'll divide this up into two individual packages, put them in a baggie, roll that up, and that's what I'm carrying on the trail. Snack items during the day, so you keep your energy level up, keep your nutrition going. Just one of those energy bars. There's tons of different kinds of those. Your uh, trail mix or gorp. And uh, that should really do it for food. We had talked about uh, the importance of hydration. Part of your hydration is getting electrolytes into your body because when, you <clears throat> when you get low on those electrolyte minerals, that's when you begin to really suffer dehydration uh, symptoms. Um, you get disoriented. You get nauseous, you can't hold food down, uh, it's pretty bad. So you want to keep hydrated, but you also want to keep the minerals you need. So the, <clears throat> there is a pill that I have of salt and magnesium just as a supplement. So you just have these pills. You take those once a day. We also have um, multiple kinds of electrolyte uh, tablets or droplets that you could put in your drinking water and um, that will help replenish your electrolytes. You don't want to bring a lot of liquid bottles of liquid Gatorade on the trail. It's just going to bog you down, um, get it in uh, your dehydrated form and add it to your, to your drinking water that you collect. And just to add to the uh, advice about water, uh, you'll need water during the day for drinking, but remember in the or for breakfast and dinner particularly, you will almost always need additional water to cook with. So you need to plan for that amount of water. Um, you need to carry it into your camp so you have it available for cooking, or you need to camp near a water source uh, so that you have the water you need to, uh, to cook your food. One additional comment on food. Uh, it's possible to hike and not cook. That's a one, one way to uh, eliminate weight, eliminate uh, space you'll need in your pack. Um, 
And uh, as a matter of fact, I, I do this. I find it just a lot more convenient. And uh, so you can go to a no-cook system. You can take the dehydrated uh, foods. You've got to experiment. Some of them don't, don't handle cold soaking very well. Others handle it very well, and it tastes great as long as you don't mind having cold food. Uh, so I just bring this little zip top, uh, Ziploc top <coughs> container. This is waterproof. I'll put my uh, dehydrated dinner inside here, fill it up with the amount of water that's required, close the top, shake it up, and I'll do this sometimes at lunch when I'm on the trail, and then by the time it's dinner time, I just take it out of my pack and I'm ready to eat. So that's something else to consider if you want to reduce weight and also time preparing food on the trail. Others would never go without the comfort and uh, the pleasure of having hot food on the trail. But I just thought I'd mention that as an alternative for saving weight. I think that's all we have to say about food, which is our last essential item that we are going to cover. Um, there are other items to consider, and they're probably close to necessary when you're on the trail. Uh, so the first we'd like to talk about is the sleep system. So a good sleeping bag is recommended to keep you warm at night. Uh, typically temperatures will go down at, at night. In some cases, depending on where you are, in northern climates, in high elevations, it will go down significantly and uh, you'll need additional insulation. So a, a good sleeping bag, uh, there's a lot of different kinds of sleeping bags, uh, different types of approaches for the way you might sleep. You've got to find what's comfortable for you. Uh, in terms of material, you have uh, sort of a natural down material made out of feathers um, and uh, it's highly compressible. So this big bag I'll stuff down into my pack almost nothing. Um, <clears throat> and so it's good that way. It's not so good when it gets wet, so you really have to take care to keep this dry. Because of the feathers, it takes a while to dry out. They make synthetic down bags now, and uh, they're a little bit better when it comes to, to water. But I like my natural down. I like to just work on keeping it dry, and that's all. Uh, so there are Different theories on sleep systems. Some people don't like bags. They don't sleep well in bags. Some people prefer quilts. So an upper quilt, under quilt. If, you, if you're in a hammock, you're probably gonna want a quilt instead of a bag. Um, so that's a whole other topic. You have to look into that and do what's comfortable for you. But you will probably need a sleeping bag of some sort on the trail. So you wanna bring the bag with the weight and the thermal rating that you're going to need for for your weather uh, during your hike. Uh, all bags are rated as far as their thermal protection and uh, so this is a 20 degree bag I believe and everyone's different how they react to the cold. Um, my experience is the rating on the bag is about uh, 10 degrees less than what I actually experienced. So, with this 20 degree bag, I would not go into under 30 degree weather. I'd probably not go into under 35 degree weather um, without getting pretty cold. Um, other things you can pack is a uh, sleeping bag liner, and this will help keep the, the bag clean um, and just uh, provide a little additional layer of insulation in addition to the bag. And uh, I've begun to carry a uh, sleeping bag liner as well. Now you're going to want something to provide comfort but also insulation um, underneath you. <clears throat> so uh, the ground is colder than you'd want to sleep on and uh, you know, with these bags where you get your thermal insulation is the loft of the bag. So what, the part you're sleeping on is not giving you much insulation because you're compressing it with the weight of your body. Uh, <clears throat> and so it's compressing down. It's not giving you any insulation. You've got the cold ground coming up underneath you 
and that's not going to be comfortable. Or if you're in a hammock, it gets really cold underneath with the wind blowing underneath your hammock. So you need some type of insulation. On the ground, you typically have a sleeping pad. This one is inflatable. This one I just blow up. Um, <clears throat> it's, you know, so it's like an air mattress, very lightweight and very slender air mattress, but it's extremely comfortable for me. Um, <clears throat> and so you'll need something like that. You also can find uh, pads that don't need to be blown up, that are just, uh, you know, um, uh, strong foam that you just roll up and uh, pack it on the outside of your pack. This one I can compress down in small format and then pack it inside my pack so I find that convenient. So that's the sleep system. Um, <clears throat> so very important to be comfortable and get a good night's sleep. Uh, it's not listed as, as an essential item, um, but I, I, I believe that most hikers, backpackers will be carrying a sleeping bag or some type of sleeping system. So that's another item to pack. Okay, another item you need to consider is how you'll protect your food that you're carrying on the trail uh, from animals, pests who will want to get into your food. Uh, in particular, bears, of course, are the, the main topic of discussion um, because there, some folks may feel a, a threat from a larger mammal like that. And in some cases, uh, it might be a threat if they become too conditioned to people. Generally, they avoid people, but if people become their food source, they will, uh, they will come around people and they won't be happy if somehow people get between them and what they've come to consider their food source. So uh, that's uh, a good uh, reason why we want to uh, practice these techniques and also leave no trace techniques where we don't leave our extra food behind on the trail or we don't throw litter on the trail. Um, so all these are very important to keeping wild animals uh, conditioned to getting their food sources from the wild and not from you. Um, yeah, so we need to protect our food from animals that are going to want to get our food. Uh, otherwise you won't have the food and you're out stuck in the middle of a hike and you don't have nutrition. So, uh, so what do we do? Uh, we want to protect the food either by hanging it so it's away from the animals so they can't get to it or packing it in a container that they, they can't get into. Okay, so let's talk about those two methods. Hanging it uh, is typically referred to as a, a bear bag. <clears throat> and uh, so you'll want to get a bag. This is a special bag. I'll talk about it in a minute. But get some bag to hold you, all your food in. And then you'll need a rope. <clears throat> Bring a length of rope with you that's long enough to throw over a branch that should be about 15 to 20 feet above the ground. Your bag should hang about, let's say, three to four feet below the branch, and it should be about 10 feet above the ground. You should throw the rope out away from the trunk of the tree so a bear can't grab it from the tree. They're very good climbers. And also, they can't climb out on the limb and reach down and get your bag. Okay, so you want to just keep the bag away from, uh, from the bear or the other animal who might want to be getting at it. <clears throat> so that's one way to do that. Um, you also want to hang that food away from your campsite. So go about 100 feet, 50 to 100 feet away from your campsite so you keep the larger mammals just away from your space and keep them in their space. Other ways to work on this problem is um, one, to reduce the scent of your food. So there are these special food bags called op sacks. And uh, <clears throat> when you pack your food in these, they prevent the odor of your food from getting out uh, into the atmosphere 
where an animal can smell the food and be attracted. Um, bears, for example, have a very powerful um, s sense of smell and they can smell your food over miles. And so you'll attract them to your area if your uh, if your smell of your food is in the air. This will help prevent that. <clears throat> so I usually pack my food first in this and then I'll pack it in my bear bag. Um, I also started using a special kind of bear bag. <clears throat> it's called an ursac and this one is made of special material that a bear cannot rip with his jaws or his claws. And so it's really like a lightweight, almost like a lightweight bear container. Uh, so <clears throat> you can pack your food in this. You can uh, just secure it to a tree somewhere. You don't necessarily have to hang it. Or you can hang it. <laughs> so in the case that they maybe do get to it or they do pull it down, they still can't get inside and get your food. Um, so I use this now, and that helps me if there's no place to hang food, <clears throat> uh, there's no trees around, um, it just gives me another layer of protection. Um, <clears throat> and then this is a bear canister. This is a hard uh, container that uh, is bear proof. I've seen these out on the trail with tooth marks in them, <laughs> with scratch marks all over them. And uh, still the bear wasn't able to get inside it. Um, it has a special screw top that only intelligent humans can open. There's a little knob there. So it's sort of like one of these trowel proof caps. So you push that knob in and then you screw the top off. <coughs> it holds quite a bit. This is, uh, this, they come in a couple different sizes. This one does fit inside my pack. I pack food, of course, inside of it <clears throat> and other items. I usually don't have quite this much food, but I could pack any other items in it to save space. Um, it's, uh, I don't know, I think it's like a pound and a half or maybe two pounds. So they definitely add some weight. Uh, in some areas, like the Great Smoky Mountains up in, in uh, North Carolina, in Tennessee, it is required in that Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Um, so it depends. You've got to check the, uh, the rules for whatever area you're hiking through. Sometimes they will, we will require uh, a bear canister. Um, so that's food protection. I would say that's mandatory. I guess it's not essential for survival, according to the 10 essentials. But uh, you really need to consider uh, bringing a bear bag, hanging your bear bag every night that you're out in the wilderness. Okay, so then your personal hygiene items. We'll talk about that. So, <clears throat> uh, cleanliness, very important on the trail. Uh, there are other people on the trail with you. Um, many times people will share food or there'll be uh, handling of utensils, handling of certain items. Um, by multiple people and um, if there is a bug out on the trail like a norovirus one of those uh, you know you'll see it spread pretty quickly there's been some pretty bad outbreaks uh, during through hike season on the Appalachian Trail for example so it's good to practice good hygiene um, what we're learning with COVID to always wash your hands uh, washing your hands with soap. You can bring a little liquid soap like this. You can use this to wash dishes as well. Uh, <clears throat> and use your hand sanitizer often. Uh, definitely after you go to the bathroom, definitely before you eat. Um, and uh, just keep yourself clean. So these personal items are also important. Uh, tooth, little thing, a toothpaste, toothbrush, small hand towel, face towel, can also be used as <clears throat> a washcloth. So you can keep your face <clears throat> and other parts of your body clean on the trail without having to take a bath or a shower. Um, and then there's uh, and then there's going to the bathroom. So 
uh, while you're out in a primitive environment, uh, in many cases you will not have any sort of an outhouse or a privy or a regular toilet of some sort. So you need to make your own. Uh, so it's recommended you dig what's called a cat hole latrine. It's six inches deep into the ground and for your, your, uh, your solid waste. And you would then need a little digging tool of some sort. This is very lightweight. I've seen them in plastic. I've seen them in this. This is like a little aluminum shovel. And you'd want to dig your six inch hole, do your business, and then <coughs> cover your hole over. You want to get out away from your campsite, away from any water source, so that uh, you're not contaminating those areas. And uh, so we'd want to bring along your toilet paper if you need, and uh, bring along your your shovel. So again, uh, not essential for survival, really essential from the point of view of uh, good sanitation while you're on the trail. So I, all these to me are necessary items. You need to bring these, <clears throat> and I pack them in a small container. So whatever I need to wash up or whatever I've got. A small bag like that to, to keep them in. Okay, let's take talk about a few other miscellaneous items you might need to pack on the trail. Uh, this is a pretty big one, but uh, this is a charger <clears throat> for your phone. So as I mentioned, uh, many of us we use the phone for our navigation device, and some type sometimes if you have signal, you can uh, use them as the communication device they're designed for, but the apps that we use on the trail are becoming more and more critical to our safe hiking and navigation. <clears throat> so we want to keep those phones charged up because they typically don't last more than, you know, a day. Uh, and so I bring this little bit larger phone charger. I also charge my Garmin on it. So this will add some weight. You can get some smaller ones. Um, but again, they won't last as many days out there, so I get I got a bigger one. And then you're going to need your cable to charge whatever kind of phone you have. And uh, if you do come into an area where there is running electricity, you're going to want, of course, your little brick to plug it in. All right, so that's uh, phone chargers, um, <clears throat> utensils. We mentioned pots and pans. You might want a cup. I don't need them on the trail, but definitely need a, a spork. So I got a spoon and a fork in one lightweight utensil. Um, let's talk about leave no trace. <clears throat> uh, we Anything we pack in, we need to pack out. So as you begin to consume your food and some of the packaging Related to that food, I try to minimize the packaging, like I said, just bring my own little baggies and wrap everything up in it. But you'll begin to accumulate some trash, so <clears throat> bring a trash bag. Might even see some trash on the trail if you can. Nice thing to do to pick it up so that we're keeping our, our trail and our wild places wild. So this is a pretty large kitchen sized trash bag. Sometimes for what I find I need, I just need a a smaller bag. I don't need such a huge trash bag, but it's important to have a way to dispose of your waste while on the trail. Um, <clears throat> a comfort item for me and for many hikers is a pair of camp shoes. So uh, to rest your feet at night when once you've finished your hike um, and you're stopping for the day, I like to change out of my hiking shoes, give my feet some breathing room, air them out a bit, and I'll put on these Crocs. These are super lightweight and they're really comfortable um, and very durable. So I bring Crocs. Other people bring different kinds of footwear, but it's nice to have uh, a change of footwear. One last item to mention are hiking poles. Hiking poles are helpful for stabilizing yourself as you hike on rugged terrain or through uh, deep uh, flooded swampy areas in Florida. Uh, many times if you take your poles you will be uh, holding them and you won't be packing them. But the poles are telescoping 
so you can uh, retract them so they're compact and pack them on the outside of your pack. Most packs have a small loop that can be used to put the ends of the poles in and then a strap at the top and then you'll be able to uh, take them along on your pack. Um, so next we're going to talk a little bit about pack weight and packs and how we pack all this in. First let's talk a little bit about pack weight. Um, I th think a good rule of thumb for, for most people would be to try to keep your pack weight for a multi-day pack uh, backpacking trip down to uh, 30 pounds or less. I think you'll be a lot more comfortable if you could keep your pack weight down, still pack all your essential items. Um, there is a um, school of thought related to backpacking that is known as ultralight. <clears throat> and ultralight packers um, are about half of that, or maybe a little more. So uh, that gets to be a pretty obsessive uh, routine to try to keep your pack rate so low. Definitely possible. It's definitely kind of fun if you're into that sort of thing. Um, I'm not really an ultralight packer, but I use some ultralight principles in order to keep my pack weight low and also be able to carry everything I need and to be safe and comfortable on the trail. So I'm usually coming in about 30 pounds packed. Uh, another core concept to think in terms of is your base weight <coughs> plus uh, as, as opposed to your total weight. All right, so think about um, the things you'll need to pack <coughs> that ex are exclusive of your water and your food because your water and your food are consumables. So as you consume your water before you replenish it again, you're going to get lighter. And same with food. So the longer you're on the trail, the more food you're going to eat, the more your pack weight is going to come down. Your pack is going to be generally lighter every day you're on the trail. Um, <coughs> so you're still dealing with a uh, a fixed weight that's not going to change and that's uh, one of the first things you need to work on in terms of lightening your load. Um, <clears throat> so one thing you want to do um, is get all your essentials. As you, If you need to purchase essentials, try to purchase a lighter weight variety. So if you have a tent, you know, I guess if you, instead of getting a five pound tent, <laughs> you, know, you may want to check on trying to get a tent that's under two pounds. Um, you can get them much lighter than that, but uh, one thing about getting into the ultralight mode is <clears throat> that super light equipment tends to get a lot more expensive. <laughs> yeah. So that's one thing to think about. So you're, uh, you know, it's another one of these balancing things. You'll be balancing weight and cost in many cases, but sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, thinking it out, <clears throat> coming up with some smart solutions for yourself. Maybe some kind of a little bit of do-it-yourself kind of gimmickry. You can come up with a lot of interesting solutions to handle your essential items, but keep your pack weight low. So again, I can't stress that enough. You're going to enjoy yourself so much more if you're not trying to, uh, you know, scale your uh, <clears throat> mountains in the Appalachian Trail with a, you know, 50-pound pack or something. So. Um, all right, so think these things through. Uh, one thing we haven't talked about yet is the, the pack itself. So of course that's a, one of our your core fundamentals uh, for your for your pack base weight is your pad the pack itself. So you can get these big packs, and the packs themselves can be like four pounds or five pounds. So you're starting from a deficit. Um, so try to get a really lightweight pack. Try not to get more pack than you need, just in terms of your capacity. So the capacity of packs is measured in liters. Um, this is a 40 liter pack. It's pretty small, but I get everything I need into it. There's this outside uh, <clears throat> pocket, mesh pocket that I put a lot of stuff in, all my wet stuff in. Um, so it's somewhat deceiving. I'm definitely packing more than 40 liters. Um, but uh, you know, try to get something down, you know, get up to 65, 75 liter packs. Uh, you're probably going to overpack because, you know, you tend to, you tend to fill the space uh, that you have. Um, <clears throat> and so there's all kinds of different packs and uh, you want one that fits you 
and that uh, carries what you need and is comfortable for you, has the convenience of the pockets you need, that sort of thing. So it's very personal taste, but there's some fundamentals. One is, of course, try and keep a light pack. Um, most people want a frame in their pack, so there are different kinds of frames. Um, these are all internal frame packs these days. You used to see in the old days these external frames, and then the pack was uh, attached to that frame. They're all pretty much internal frame packs now, and they just have different types of uh, frames and types of suspension systems to keep the pack <coughs> away from your body so you're not uh, perspiring on the pack. Um, it's all kinds of different methods and designs. We're not going to get into all that yet. But the basics are your shoulder straps. You're going to have shoulder straps. And in most cases, except for extreme ultralighters, you're going to have <coughs> this waist strap. Okay. So the idea of wearing your pack is to keep the weight on your hips with the waist strap. So you want to strap that up tight, keep your weight on the hips and the shoulders are pretty much just to balance the weight, just to help you balance the weight. So you can adjust with these straps at the top and adjust the strap. You can also adjust some of the angle with some packs. There's another little strap in here. We have just the angle that the pack is fitting on your back. And so those are the basic items of pack construction. And <coughs> you're gonna want a pack that fits correctly because <coughs> if it's too small or big for your torso, like from here to here, then the straps aren't gonna fit right. The weight isn't gonna be balanced correctly on your hips and you're gonna suffer. So just like with footwear, if you're doing it for the first time, I would suggest going to a good retailer and getting fitted for your pack. Okay, once you have your pack, once you have all the contents you want to bring along on your hike, then you need to pack the pack. So, there's so a few things to keep in mind. You probably want to pack <coughs> your lighter, softer materials on the bottom. You want your heavier weight centered in the pack in the middle and towards the top of the pack. If it's too much on the very top, then you're gonna to be top heavy, it's hard to balance. If it's on the bottom, you're gonna feel that stuff right against your back, your lower back uh, and your hips. Um, so you, you want it centered is the, is the point here. So you can pack your softer stuff in the bottom and your heavier stuff in the middle. I also find, <clears throat> just for convenience, the things you're gonna to wanna to get to when you're out in the middle of the, of the hike, you want it as close to the top as possible. So this tends to work out. Like my sleeping bag, I'll put in the bottom. A lot of my clothes I'll put in the bottom that I'm not gonna need during the day. <clears throat> that sort of thing. And then maybe your, your food items and uh, <clears throat> other things you might need during the day are gonna be a little more solid, a little heavier. They'll be more towards the middle and the top. And then you can also get to them easily. So think about that when you're packing too, is having the things you need to have accessible uh, during your hike, have them, you know, easily accessible. Once you have packed your backpack, weigh it. You can use your home scale. First, weigh yourself without your pack, then put on your pack and weigh yourself again. The difference between the two weights is your pack weight. Try to keep this 30 pounds or less. To make decisions about where to cut weight, it's good to weigh each item you're packing and keep in a list or a spreadsheet and decide which items you can do without or find a lighter alternative. There's a lot to say about packing a pack, um, but that's about all I'm gonna cover right now. Those are some of the basics. Um, you know, the main thing I would stress is if you haven't been backpacking before, pack your pack before you go out on the trail, before you go on your real hike, pack your pack, walk around your neighborhood, do five miles or something with the pack. It's just like your footwear. You won't know the problems you're gonna have till you get up above five, six, seven, eight miles. Then you're gonna see where you have problems. So I would definitely recommend taking a test hike on a loop trail or something where you're not gonna be too far away from being able to exit the trail. and. Uh, Test it all out, get your gear tested, 
um, first before you hit the trail for several days. Yeah, I'll attach to this video uh, the list of gear and the 10 essential items. Thank you very much. Take them along on your pack.